Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is stoked about a beautiful aster. We have some great performing tomatoes for the home garden that are also potentially healthier. We find out how the city of Oklahoma City is working to monitor the health and financial benefits of the urban forest. Julia Laughlin, OSU Extension Horticulturalist with Oklahoma County, has a fun vegetable container project for kids. And Barbara Brown cooks a spicy rice. Aster is a native North American plant that is a really great wildflower to also add into your home landscape. You can see here it has very large uh, two and a half inch flowers that will not only attract people but also attract pollinators into your garden. Now these flowers come in a range of white to pinks to purples and even blues and they set atop this basal growth. It'll bloom about June through September, but it's best if you continue to deadhead it to encourage those flowers to come on. Now this one we have here is a white cultivar, but there's another cultivar called Color Will, um, which actually starts out with white buds, but those buds slowly transition into a more of a purple or bluish color, but they still retain a white center to them. And so as the, the flower and the plant grows, you'll get several different stages of those flowers and it'll exhibit different shades of white to purple flowers on one plant. Stokes Aster is hardy from zones five to nine. Now, if you live in more of a zone five, you're gonna to wanna to mulch this during the winter just to give it a little bit of protection. And actually in zones nine, um, in the southern climates, it's pretty evergreen. So you're gonna have that foliage throughout uh, the winter months. Stokes Aster has no major pest problems and it likes well-drained average sandy soils. Um, one of the problems that can cause it to die in your landscape is to really have it setting in uh, wet conditions throughout those winter months. So you want to be aware of that if you have heavy clay soils. While it prefers full sun, you can see it handles partial shade as well. Behind us here under this uh, crepe myrtle, Stokes Aster is really great for our summer heat and is very drought tolerant once it's established. It's another native wildflower that you should consider adding to your landscape. This year we're looking at three University of Florida varieties in our tomato study. We looked at these three last year because we were told that they have higher lycopene content. And lycopene is an antioxidant which has many health benefits. It's known to help with problems with cancer, diabetes, heart problems. So it's very beneficial and good for you. Uh, most of your red fruit have lycopene in them. Watermelons has always been known to have a lot of high lycopene. And then now we're finding out certain varieties of tomatoes do. These actually we tested last year and they had almost double what some of our other varieties did as far as lycopene content. As far as our varieties go, we have three varieties and these can be available. Uh, you have to get on the University of Florida website in order to get them and they ask for a $10 donation for their variety trials that they're doing. Um, the three varieties we have are Garden Gem, which is kind of a smaller, more of a cherry-sized tomato. Uh, it, it is very flavorful, and it's a hybrid. It's been built up to be 
kind of something like from the past of your old heirloom tomatoes. And this has been, you know, something that'll produce a lot better, have a better shelf life. You know, all these varieties are considered to have more shelf life than the old heirloom varieties. Our next variety is Garden Treasure, and Garden Treasure is a little bit larger to tomato. It's a cross of an old Brandywine heirloom. And uh, it produced a lot of fruit last year. In fact, it was the highest in our taste testing that we had. And uh, very consistent tomato, and I think would be really good for a home garden. And our last tomato um, that's part of the University of Florida is W Hybrid. And it's more of a moderate sized tomato and with excellent flavor, shelf life, and consistent on quality and quantity. All three of these varieties are bred to have higher quality, better shelf life, and uh, just easier to grow than the old heirloom varieties. Um, they have disease resistance built in them, so you shouldn't have as many issues as you did with old heirlooms. Plus you have the benefits of the flavor that you would with the old heirloom varieties. These three varieties we have on raised beds, and we do a stake and weave method as far as trellising them. Uh, rather than using cages. Cages can get expensive and, uh, and as many tomatoes as we have you've got to find a place to keep all of your cages so it's just easier for us to do a stake and weave method. Our raised beds we've added straw to them to help keep down disease. Um, that straw when you've got water splashing on soil it shoots up on your leaves and causes a lot of disease issues so we try to do that as well as pruning. We also do some pruning on them, um, take off all the suckers down low and a lot of the leaves that are down low as well. Um, these three varieties are all a little bit different as far as their growing methods. We've got a determinant, an indeterminate, and a semi-determinant. So we are going to get different growth heights on them, but I think they're all excellent choices for a home gardener. I'm Brian Doherty with the Oklahoma City Community Foundation. I'm the director of the Parks and Public Space Initiative. Over the last 25 years, the Community Foundation has been very involved in planting trees in parks and neighborhoods and public spaces all around Oklahoma City. And you know, uh, you know we're always looking at how do we put the best sustainable trees in, the diversification into the parks and public space, how can we make this investment really go for the next 50, 7,500 years? With today's technology and the uh, satellite imagery and Google Earth, we're able to do things with tree inventories they couldn't have done 50, 25 years ago. So in 2016, we worked with the Oklahoma Forestry Services, Oklahoma City Community Foundation, and City of Oklahoma City, and we put together with Davy Resources a tree inventory of every tree in the 132 parks. So we have 19,800 trees where about 20 data points were taken off each tree. The height, its species, its size, its condition. This all really is a proactive approach to what the future can be. So what we are able to do is we know how many Schumert oaks are there. We know how they're performing. We know about the bald cypress. We know which ones. And as Riley had talked about with emerald ash borer possibly coming, we also can identify things like the ash and know where more susceptible varieties are. So with this, it goes into a database. Every time the park does trimming, they need to remove a tree, they need to do uh, any kind of maintenance, the database then updates the inventory every day. If we get ready to add, like we've just added 800 trees along the river, those trees then are all added into the database. We know where they are, we know what they are, we know when we can really track that. This is going to be incredibly important for the new MAPS 4 coming up where they're talking about going into every park 
and you turn around, you have this kind of database available so we know what is existing, we know what kind of trees are existing. I think, you know, to take it to the next level, 2019, we had always wanted to, how can we also move into the neighborhood, the greater Oklahoma City area, and many cities are starting to do this, so we were able to do a tree canopy assessment different, we don't go back to every single tree, but they're able to analyze whole blocks, whole areas. So it's around 580 square miles that we were able to do the imagery. With these two products, we can really look, and, and we were learning a lot of things. Western Soapberry really performs well along a lot of our trails. We have a lot of our oaks, our blackjacks and, uh, and post oaks probably have a lot more value than what some people had ever given them credit. And so when they're working with, whether they're working with stormwater control, whether they're working with other environmental issues, whether you're looking at quality of life, whether you're looking at economic benefits, trees are a big part of it. And so the more we were able to stay on the proactive side, we're able to sit there and really plan for the future. We're not the only city doing this. Tulsa's doing this. Many cities around the country, different ones are doing them in different ways. But it's really taking what we've known for a long time. If we know what kind of trees are going to grow, we know that, then we're able to plan better. But it's taking it to a whole new level with the technology that's available today. On the tree canopy study, you know, it's, it's a whole new level of sophistication when you're taking this many square miles and you're looking from, from south of Norman to north of Edmond, you're taking from Yukon and Mustang on and including all of Tinker Air Force Base, but with the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments, ACOG, they had a lot of the LIDAR data. Forestry had a lot of data they were able to, and when we needed to turn around and find our 300 spots in inventory, they had the ability to do the check and balance on that. And then the Community Foundation working to all of us in partnership with Davey, that's what makes something work. And I think it's this private, public, public partnership that really does it. And now it's available for everyone to use. I'm Julia Laughlin from the Oklahoma County Extension Office and we're planning a big summer camp for kids this summer called Planted Earth. It's in late July and you can find information about it at our, at our website but I wanted to show you one of the projects that we were going to do with the kids and it's actually something that you could do with your kids at home right now even though it's midsummer and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a gardening project that is done in a container. This is actually a smart pot a smart pot is a fabric cloth bag. You've probably seen them on the show before and we like to use them with kids because they make an instant garden and they come in different sizes. Um, with this one what we've done is filled it with some high quality garden potting soil. You could add some extra compost to it if you wanted to make it a little bit richer. If you decide not to add any compost you may want to add some fertilizer for the project we're going to do. The fertilizer would help the plants grow a little bit faster as well. And then what we're doing is we're taking a four-week-old transplant of a squash or a cucumber or you could use something else. Um, but the reason we used a cucurbit is if you can make a little, if you start a few seeds in a pot right now 
and make a transplant and then the kids put it into the pot, it'll work out great for you to have harvest this summer. So we just took some summer squash and started it in a little four inch pot, put it on the back patio, watered it and let it come up. This plant's about four or five weeks old. And then we're gonna pot that into the smart pot with, that's filled with the potting soil. Tease those roots out a little bit. And I'm gonna put it just slightly to the side because we're also gonna add with this project, we're gonna add a basil plant. Now these actually are older than that. These are more like 10 or 12 weeks old. And so um, we got them started, but they could be a little bit smaller than this if you wanted to for your project as well. You could do a four or five week old basil. So you could start both of these in little four inch pots on your patio and then plan to plant them in the big container. Same thing here. I'm just gonna tease those roots out a little bit and plant it on the edge of the container. Right now is when you'd probably wanna add some fertilizer. In our summer camp, because we're teaching environmental education, we're also gonna add this little rain gauge. So the kids, we're gonna teach them about how much water to add to the pot every week and have them measure how much water they put in by using the rain gauge. And then we'll have the kids water the pot in and they get to take them home. And later in the, in the summer, they'll have little baby squash like these. Aren't those cute? And some fresh basil leaves. And they'll go home with a couple of recipes that use squash and basil together. So they'll learn about using herbs and using vegetables together. They're also gonna learn about some tips about conservation and environmental science for the planet. And that's our Planted Earth Summer Camp. Today we're doing spicy rice and baked eggs and I hope you're going to enjoy this one because it's kind of fun and it's also something that you find in many different cultures and so you find variations uh, of a theme. This one's got more of a Mexican Spanish feel to it but you could do it with changing the herbs and spices and make it anywhere. So I'm going to put two tablespoons of, I'm using canola oil, you could use uh, good olive oil in here as well uh, and just let that start to simmer and then I've got a medium chopped onion. I think that's good enough. Yep, it's making a nice sizzle for me. Uh, one jalapeno that's been minced. A clove of garlic, also minced. And our goal here is to uh, get these all stirred together and let them cook for about five minutes, but I've got a few more things that we're gonna add to it uh, before we do. I've got a, a teaspoon of cumin, a teaspoon of chili powder, teaspoon of thyme, and then a half a teaspoon of black pepper, and a fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt. And we're going to stir those together and let them continue to cook. Uh, because we have so many things in here, we're going to get, let the herbs or then the spices also develop some of the flavor. We're going to cook off some of the rawness, so we're going to let this go for about four minutes. And then we'll come back. The onion should start to become translucent by that time. Okay, I've got a uh, cup of black beans. Now you can either cook your own, you can use canned. Try and drain them fairly well. If you're using canned, also make sure that you rinse them. And then I've also got a half a cup of yellow corn kernels. Now, you can use whatever kind that, that you want to use. You can use fresh, you can use frozen, you can use canned. Uh, again, if you're using canned, you may want to choose a variety that doesn't have any salt because we've added salt to this already. The same with the black beans. If you can get no salt added variety, you're going to be a little bit more uh, helpful from a nutrition standpoint. You can always add your own salt, if it's, but, but it's nice to be in control. All right, two cups of tomatoes or a 14 and a half ounce can, which isn't quite two cups, but is close enough. And let that come uh, back up to a, a boil which is already done, and we're gonna stir in two cups of cooked rice. Now make sure that your rice is already cooked at this point, or because we've added ingredients that have a lot of acid in them, as in the tomatoes, uh, the uh, onions on, uh, will also have some. So I you can't count on the rice being cooked because of that uh, amount of acid that you've added in. 
So I'm going to get a little bit different tool that's a little bit sturdier. I want to break that up a little bit more so that you, the, the goal is simply to coat all of the rice and make sure that there's some uh, on everything. Now, I am using a white rice, which is somewhat unusual for me. I'm usually using a whole grain when I'm uh, cooking for you. Uh, but for this, I went with rice. Um, partly because that was what the original recipe called for, but I also uh, wanted to uh, show you that it can be done. Remember that half of your grains are supposed to be a whole grain every day, uh, and you can still use some of these kinds of products that we have all grown up using. All right, that's pretty close. Now our goal here is to bring this back to a simmer. The rice was pretty cold. This is one of those things where in, uh, a lot of times uh, you'll, you'll think, well, I don't need this much rice. And so I always cook extra rice because I'm always either making uh, fried rice or I can use it for something like this. So let's bring that up to a little bit higher heat. When that gets nice and warm, while it's getting nice and warm, I'm going to go ahead and crack some eggs. This is, remember, baked eggs. So many of us cook eggs and we get in a rut and we always cook eggs the same way. Uh, so I'm going to bake the eggs. Now notice I'm putting it into a small container here. Um, I'm going to make a hollow or an indentation, four of them, in the rice that we have over here. And I'm going to slide one of the eggs in. Now when you're doing this, always break your eggs into a separate container. Don't just crack the egg in two there. Because if you do that, you find you've got a blood spot or you've got shell, it's going to be real hard to fish it out. So the eggs, one in each of the hollows. The fresher the eggs are going to be, the better off they're going to be as far as standing up to what you're doing here. We're then going to put them, this whole thing in a 400 degree oven and let the eggs bake until they're as done as you'd like them. They should, at least the whites should be totally set and the yolks should be starting to gel. At that point, you know they're done enough that they're going to be safe. Whether you're doing easy over eggs or sunny side up, as long as the whites are totally set and the yolks are starting to gel, uh, then you're good. As I said, this is going to go in the oven. You don't need to cover it. It's going to bake for oh, somewhere between 10 to 12 minutes, depending on how well you like your eggs done and how your oven's working. So we'll see if I can get this over there. Isn't that beautiful? So you can see that the yolks are still runny, uh, but they're not runny. Uh, they started to, to thicken up to, to some degree. So I'm going to let that sit for a minute. I've got a little bit more I'm going to do as a topping. Uh, I've got um, a fourth of a cup of nonfat sour cream and the zest, a half a teaspoon of lime zest, and two teaspoons of lime juice. And we're just going to stir those together. And this is going to be a topping on top of this if we get them stirred together well enough. Also on it, I've got uh, about a fourth of a cup, two tablespoons of cilantro. Now, you can leave this off if you choose, uh, both. Um, or you could substitute, if you're one of the people that's not a fan of cilantro, you can substitute Italian parsley. Uh, that will work equally well. Or you can not do either. All right. This is ready to go. See if I can get this out without breaking the yolk. And this becomes a complete meal again. Um, or you can have it as a side dish. You could also have this at breakfast if you chose, uh, or at lunch. It can be served at any time during the day. A little bit of our topping on the side here. And a little bit of cilantro on top of that. And let's see if we can break the egg and see how it looks on the inside. Okay, this one's cooked about perfect for me. I'm not a fan of a, a real, really liquidy yolk. So I like mine about like that. That took about uh, 12 minutes. But again, it's going to vary depending on how you like it, how your oven works, and the temperature of the, everything when you get it into the oven. So ballpark 10 to 12 minutes. I hope you'll try this. This is spicy rice and baked eggs. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey will have the top five things you need for a great shade garden. There'll be some fun kids' garden activities and maybe even an edible song. We'll build simple and inexpensive raised beds in the vegetable garden. And we'll battle those pesky gophers. We wish you health and wellness. And we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.